Hi, hello. Thank you for joining us for this Vapes Are Trash panel. Uh, my name is Charlie Moses. I'm the Western Regional Advocacy Manager here at Parents Against Vaping, and I'll be moderating our panel this afternoon. So Parents Against Vaping came up with the campaign and concept of Vapes Are Trash a couple years back while working under a grant from the New York City Department of Health. And this was in response to parents who were constantly reaching out to us, concerned that their kids felt vaping wasn't harmful to them. So we decided to address just how harmful vaping is to the environment, seeing the high potential for environmental and climate justice issues to resonate with young people. This is another way we felt to open up the conversation for how vaping negatively impacts your personal environment, your brain, your body, your lungs. We've been talking with different partners about the best way to tailor and expand this program to different communities. And I wanted to share real quick um, just a, a slide of kind of what our campaign looks like, um, as well as some content that we've shared over media um, throughout the past couple of years. Um, so that's a little bit about our Vapes or Trash campaign, where the name is coming from for this particular panel. Um, but with that, Without further ado, uh, I'm honored to welcome our two panelists today. So presenting first, we have Lucas Rocket Gutterman, Director of the Design to Last Campaign, fighting against obsolescence and e-waste and winning concrete policy changes that extend electronic consumer product lifespans, hold manufacturers accountable for forcing upgrades or disposal, and advance paradigm-busting conversations around electronic products. And presenting second is Dr. Jeremiah Mock, a health anthropologist who conducts research on the tobacco endgame, environmental protection, health promotion, and cannabis use. He is a professor at the University of California, San Francisco and the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And his research is based at the UCSF Institute for Health and Aging. He's a member of the UCSF and UpEnd Project for Endgame Planning and the UCSF Center for Tobacco Control Research and Education. We're gonna have about 10 minutes at the end of our presentation for questions. So if you do have questions to ask, feel free to put them in the Q&A. I can't promise we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can. And now on to Lucas. Thank you both so much for presenting. Let's take it away. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Charlie, and thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna share my slides here. So I wanna talk a little bit about the report that I put out um, a couple months ago now called Vape Waste, the Environmental Harms of Disposable Vapes. You get to hear a lot about the different environmental harms and hopefully actually leave with a feeling of some solutions that we can take action on today um, and some long-term solutions as well to tackle this problem. Um, but just to introduce myself a little bit more, I work with PERG, the Public Interest Research Group. Um, we are a one million member national advocacy organization with state-based groups like CalPERG in California and TexPERG in Texas. We work on issues that we really just shouldn't tolerate in our society of, of technological um, advancement and abundance. And as Charlie mentioned, my campaign is called Design to Last. So I'm looking at issues of tech obsolescence and electronic waste and longevity. And that's sort of how I, I fell into this issue of disposable vapes um, or e-cigarettes. And we have heard a lot in this conference and I'm sure we will hold a lot of great information just about the, the public health harms of disposable vapes. But I was really interested, and what I wanna talk about today is just what are the harms of these products as hazardous electronic waste? I kind of got into this by just thinking it really just doesn't make any sense at all to be manufacturing electronics with rechargeable batteries, shipping them around the world, and then just throwing them out within a few days. I think the fundamental value that was really sort of offensive to me was just this idea that we should not be using anything for a day or two, which then pollutes our environment for hundreds of years. And the environmental movement has done a lot of great work raising awareness about the waste from single-use plastics, but disposable electronics have often been overlooked. 
I think disposable electronics, you know, it's, it's particularly egregious. And we'll talk about some of the problems with electronic waste, but these are some of the most complex products that we've ever learned how to make, right? We have these integrated circuits and scarce and toxic metals and these world spanning supply chains. And with e-waste, the fastest growing waste stream in the world, the rate at which we dispose of these electronics is just not sustainable. So let's talk about disposal vapes in particular, right? These are single use products. They're powered by the very same rechargeable lithium ion batteries that we use in our electric cars and our iPhones. But unlike traditional vapes, they're designed to be thrown out after use. And that's because while well, some of them can be recharged with a USB cable, once they run out of the e-liquid the e with the nicotine that they come with, um, they can't be refilled. So they're wasteful, they're harmful, they're trending, um, as we'll see in just a second. You can actually see in this picture on the right that USB charging port, you know, that's the same port you might see on your phone. And that's the lithium ion battery. And we'll get to kind of look at a, a live sample of this in just a second. So I'm saying that these are trending and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the first presenter uh, to talk about this, but that there you know, is this new situation, relatively new, in which these products are increasingly popular. So the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA in 2020, cracked down on flavored nicotine, e-liquid cartridges for reusable vapes, um, things like Juul. But after that uh, change, sales of disposable brands increased by over 196% by March 2023. This, this comes from the CDC Foundation. So the FDA's decision you know, prohibited the sale of flavored pre-filled nicotine vape cartridges. Sort of, we think of Juul as the key example, but they didn't mention disposable vapes explicitly. This was sort of a sin of omission, which created this gray market. Um, and by March, sales of disposable products had increased to 11.9 million units a month. They've overtaken the cartridge market share. They're now 53% of vape sales. And the amount of disposable vapes that Americans are buying is really shocking. At this rate, we're throwing out four and a half disposable vapes every single second in this country. So few products are really as harmful and as popular as disposable vapes. I really think we shouldn't tolerate any disposable electronics, but we especially shouldn't tolerate any that trash our environment and our public health. So as part of the um, disposable or the vape waste report, and um, this was uh, some coverage in time that that report got, which was pretty exciting. Um, we just found a lot of really shocking statistics about the scale of this problem, right? According to the same scale estimates, uh, sale estimates we just looked at, lining up all the disposable vapes sold in a year would stretch for 7,000 miles. That's long enough to span all the way from coast to coast and back again. Um, this vape waste is just becoming increasingly more common while cigarette buds are actually becoming less common as the trash that's littering our beaches and waterways. Kind of seems like we've gone from bad to worse. Unfortunately, cigarette pollution can take up to 10 years to degrade, but disposable vapes are just non-biodegradable and they can endanger ocean creatures that inadvertently consume the plastic that they use. So it's almost like companies looked at all the cigarette buds that were polluting our beaches and they thought I can make something even worse. That's never gonna be de uh, decomposed and it's gonna leach toxic chemicals, unfortunately. So beyond just the scale of the waste, there is just a huge problem once the user is done with these products. And that's because there is no standard legal way to recycle disposable vapes. Unfortunately, most disposable vapes won't even face this problem uh, because only about 25% of the electronic waste in this country is actually recycled. Um, but even if these vapes are disposed of properly and they're sent to a recycling center, um, they often can't be collected. So for example, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, actually began accepting electronic uh, cigarette devices and cartridges during their prescription take back day, but they can't accept devices containing lithium ion batteries. So what makes these products really difficult to deal with is they have three different components that all sort of require different processes and different um, organizations and companies that actually take them. So I'm gonna show these three parts here now. So here's the, the plastic shell of, uh, you know, kind of Escobar um, style disposable vape, it's, uh, strawberry ice flavored. Um, you know, this plastic shell never fully degrades. They follow in the footsteps of all these other really environmentally harmful single use pod products like coffee pods, or now we're even seeing pods that are for hair dye. 
Um, plastic is just really hard to recycle. So that's sort of in and of itself a problem. Inside that plastic case, we have the electronic component right here. So you can see the, the circuit board, there's the USB charger. So, you know, you can recharge this battery. Um, the battery is connected via these wires it's just soldered on there. And then we have this tube that goes into the e-liquid that has nicotine, um, which, um, you know, is then vaporized. And then finally we have the e-liquid itself, which is which is in this sponge um, and it, it smells really strong, uh, but that, that's where that comes from. So we have all these different components. We have the plastic, we have the electronic waste that requires, you know, whole e-waste process. Um, the battery that's soldered in that can't be removed, that can't really be included in most electronic waste processes because it can damage the equipment. Um, and then we have the nicotine, which actually is um, hazardous waste, according to the EPA, and that needs a whole separate process. So, you know, they can't be recycled, uh, they can't be reused, they can't be thrown in the trash legally. It's kind of no wonder that these are an environmental threat and consumers are really left with, with little to no choice. And then um, the last thing I'll just point out here is just that uh, these products are really wasteful to manufacture in the first place, right? They require critical level uh, metals like lithium. That's finite. We're throwing them out. Um, we found that the lithium used by the batteries in disposable vapes every year weighs 23.6 tons. That's equivalent to the lithium needed to create batteries for 2,600 electric vehicles. So tech like vapes requires metals such as cobalt and platinum and gold and rare earth elements. Mining these minerals is really destructive and these metals are not infinite. At some point we will run out. So I wanna end here with just some recommendations. Um, the first thing that people can do is just actually sign this petition, um, which I believe Josh is gonna put in the chat here. Fundamentally, we just should not tolerate any disposable electronics. These are easily the worst of the bunch. These products harm our health and the environment. They waste these finite resources. They harm our public health. The only solution is a ban. So um, luckily the FDA is sort of enforcing their rules on the books against the unauthorized sale of these products. They have delivered more than 560 warning letters to firms for manufacturing, selling and distributing new tobacco products. That's a strong start, but I think our findings and maybe folks on this call's experience show that these products are still really ubiquitous and easy to buy. And so these environmental harms should add urgency to the FDA's enforcement and they should prevent the authorization of any proposals. States and cities can step up, as we saw in that article about New York City stepping up their enforcement. We should make sure that they're enforcing the laws in the books. And then lastly, this petition is actually calling on retailers to not sell these disposable products. 7-Eleven um, and gas companies like Shell, Chevron, BP, Sunoco, Sitco, Mobile, Marathon, Exxon, they've all been found selling these products on their store shelves. We should be holding them accountable. They should be holding franchisees accountable with a zero tolerance stance. So make sure you sign that petition. Um, and thanks so much for your time. I'm looking forward to the uh, Q&A. Great, Lucas, thank you so much. And, you know, I want to highlight again, you said in the U.S. alone, we're throwing out 4.5 vapes a second, which when you calculate that to a day, so a single day in the U.S., that's around 388,800 vapes just in a day, um, which is so jarring, so shocking. I want to hand it off now to Dr. Mock, um, you know, highlighting the scientific aspects of this, as well as the FDA's kind of lack of action on the matter. So Dr. Jeremiah Mock, please take it away. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, Charlie, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to, um, to be with you all today. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen and let's see if this gets going. So I'm out in uh, California in Marin County, just uh, over the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. And this is our beautiful coastline. And uh, I want to talk with you just a little bit today about the importance of eliminating tobacco um, vaping waste. And uh, I would like to acknowledge that I'm living on the ancestral lands of the coastal Miwok people. And I think that we as a society would do well to embrace the sense of stewardship and care of the land of the native peoples all across this country. So uh, Lucas mentioned uh, the FDA's enforcement policy and 
that was issued in uh, January of 2020 with regard to cartridge-based e-cigarettes. And um, if you're interested to know why we've experienced this rapid proliferation of disposable uh, devices, this is actually the footnote 21 here, where uh, the FDA explicitly um, did not include disposable products in its definition of, uh, of e-cigarette devices. And that's the, the hole that created the opportunity. So we saw this explosion in particularly the, the disposable devices, most recently the, the recent generation of rechargeable devices that Lucas uh, talked briefly about. And um, that, that, for those of you who recall, it's amazing how fast the industry moves. That really started here in California with a puff bar disposable device, um, which was not rechargeable, uh, just single use. And um, this, as, as Lucas mentioned, ha, you know, the devices uh, invariably contain a residue of nicotine salts, which are an EPA regulated acute hazardous substance, along with other substances that are carcinogenic and, uh, and harmful. So this is the generation that came afterward with the high capacity devices um, purporting to deliver up to 5,000 puffs. And uh, I, we've seen a lot of these. So this is a device that's leached out its, its contents uh, in the rain on a pavement. Another one, another elf bar. Um, we've seen the industry stay ahead of the FDA with regard to renaming their products after warning letter, uh, letters have been issued. And uh, this is a pretty good example of what um, Vapes Are Trash is really all about. So this is actually behind a vape shop. And um, there are just you know a bunch of vapes that I that I found uh, along with all of the plastic disposable um, packaging. So um, one of the other big uh, offenders is the is flume, and these are a bunch of flume floats that we found, and the latest flume float version, which is the even higher capacity pebble. And so I want to talk a little bit about what is in these uh, devices that's of concern. So as we've already discussed, nicotine is the most uh, significant uh, chemical compound that we should be concerned about. It's actually a uh, a very powerful neurotoxin. Um, there are some trace and tobacco-specific nitrosamines, which are carcinogenic, as well as the VOCs um, that are also very harmful to human health, and uh, a range of uh, toxic heavy, heavy metals that accumulate in the environment that are diffused out. These are called chronic uh, environment ecotoxins. And then uh, concerns about the uh, propylene glycol and ve vegetable glycerin, which were thought to be you know, completely harmless, but now increasingly uh, the FDA is recognizing that these, these chemicals are, are harmful and hopefully the FDA, if they haven't already, will add them to the list of um, their list of harmful and potentially harmful constituents. And then there are the metallic nanoparticles and the plastic and electronic components and the flammable lithium ion batteries that uh, you probably know these things can, can uh, spontaneously combust. They've done that, that's happened with people in their faces and on uh, in their pockets. And so it's a, it's a wildfire and structural fire um, ignition hazard. So just to uh, remind everybody that vaping is a much wider uh, phenomenon than nicotine. And these are a couple of examples of uh, cannabis vaping devices. I know PAVE is increasingly concerned about cannabis vaping use. So this is a typical cartridge that we find around that's been thrown on the ground. And just to give you a quick uh, overview of that, there are 16 uh, chemicals that are used in manufacturing pesticides, eight solvents, and four chemicals used in the, in the making of plastics, along with others, including um, nickel and, and lead that have been found in cannabis vape aerosols. So presumably those are also in the, the discarded um, cartridges themselves. Eight of those are on the FDA's list of harmful or potentially harmful constituents. And this is just a list from a study that was done 
um, showing a, a wide range of chemicals that are found in the aerosols of concern. So presumably these are also leaching out from devices that are discarded. So let's talk quickly about what the solutions are. The industry would like to tell you that they are, you know, concerned about this problem and that they're um, engaging in, in customers and take back programs. This is really just greenwashing. And so I, I think these programs are very ineffective, but give the industry the opportunity to present themselves as being uh, concerned and taking action about the environmental impacts. So um, demand reduction is one side of the economics equation and education works. So just another shout out to PAVE in organizing a, an amazing campaign to raise public awareness about this issue. The, the second side of the economics equation is about supply. So supply reduction really can work. Ultimately, banning the sale of the products is, is a direction that we need to be moving. Uh, so just to take you back to, you know, the proliferation of the products, um, here in California, uh, since about uh, 2020, there was a, a real surge in local ordinances being passed to ban the sale of flavored tobacco products. And as you probably know, the vast majority, upwards of 90, 95% of the, uh, of the vaping devices are flavored. So it, here in Marin County, um, all the jurisdictions pass flavor bans. So we had an, a, an entire county covered with bans. And then that ultimately moved up to the state level with a proposition that, um, that put to the voters the question, should all flavored tobacco products be banned? And as you can see in that referendum, 64 uh, or nearly 64% of the population voted in favor of the ordinance. The big cities were uh, in California were solidly behind this and very few counties that actually uh, did not support it. And here in Marin County, we had the highest level of support at 87 percent, owing to the fact that there had just been a lot of public education and political activism on the issue for, for several years before the, um, the ban was put into place. So what happens is you uh, see these vape shops that, that were out there, vape dreams, and if you notice uh, it said 50% off on all items, this vape shop uh, went out of business fairly shortly after the proposition was passed and, and due to be implemented. Business closed due to Prop 31. Um, and so that's the, that's the direction I think we need to be moving is really uh, continuing with uh, demand reduction and but really looking at focused focused efforts on supply reduction because ultimately if we get rid of the devices they're no longer on shelves we eliminate the public health problem of consumption and addiction and we also eliminate the environmental impact so thanks very much for your attention i'd love to hear your comments and questions Great. Jeremiah, thank you again so much for presenting. Um, and Lucas, thank you again as well. With that, I want to jump right into our questions. And I know the, the overarching question from our audience is, of course, how are vapes disposed of properly? Is there a proper way to dispose of vapes? Um, wondering if there are different jurisdictions or departments of sanitation that are accepting vapes. I mean, we know that separating disposable vapes especially is its own hazard and issue, um, but maybe just some some comments from, from both of you on, on this subject. Yeah, I would just say that Lucas, I would not recommend, to, do not open up disposable vapes and try and remove the battery. That, that can be unsafe, so please don't do that. Um, it's going to be different in every jurisdiction. That's unfortunately just the way that electronic waste and hazardous waste rules work in, in our country. Um, I would contact your local municipal information, uh, check online, see if they have a safe disposal event where they're taking electronic waste. In my experience, you have to repeatedly remind the person you're talking to that you're talking about a disposable vape where the battery cannot be removed. So make sure that they're aware of that, but there are there are increasing programs. I know that Boulder, Colorado and, and New York City, um, at least that they will take these products. 
You can also try calltorecycle.com, which is a national website to find local e-waste um, collection events. Yeah, the the problem fundamentally is, uh, as Lucas already mentioned, that it, the teardown of these products is uh, hazardous to anybody who's dealing with them. And it's also just not um, economically viable. It, it It's far too labor intensive. And uh, so even here in Marin, where for decades we have had our own waste management um, heavily committed to, you know, 100% recycling, um, I've taken these devices to them and they say, we don't accept them, just toss them in your household trash. There's really, uh, and even if, if you do see programs where they're actually taking them back, the likelihood is that they're just being ground up and, and the contents are going to leach out into landfill anyway. Yeah, no one's sitting there with a tweezer and taking all the components off the circuit board or, or separating things. So so from yeah, an environmental yeah. standpoint, you know, there there is no real recycling that's happening with these products, but it is worth being a sort of good Samaritan and making sure that they're being disposed of properly at least. Yeah, and just to point to put a point on that, um, uh, Lucas was talking about that it's it's hazardous to take them apart. That's because nicotine is absorbed dermally. So if you get this stuff on your hands, uh, and you're going to be breathing it because it, you know, unless you're wearing a, a respirator, because it it volatilizes in the air. Yeah, thank you both so much for this response. It it is such a challenge to you know to because we all want to be able to do something or have some kind of program or just a place that we can direct and, and point people to. But at this point in time, there isn't an easy option. Um, you know, and as terrible as these disposables are, I do just want to say that, you know, at Parents Against Vaping, we support ending the sale of all flavored tobacco products, disposables or not. Um, and that it's just so necessary to kind of look at different avenues that go beyond just the disposal point, like addressing the FDA, addressing retailers, trying to get um, other organizations on board with kind of ending the sale of these products completely, um, as opposed to kind of this far down the creek, trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, so another another question we have is, are cities and counties allowed to pass local ordinances or fees to apply financial and environmental accountability for local vaping industries? Yes. <laughs> and, and they can also just enforce the, the FDA rules on the books. Um, but I would um, be cautious of, um, you know, Dr. Mock's point about take back programs or you know, when, when you say fees and incentivizing recycling, really, th these should not be sold at all, and they should not be manufactured. And that's sort of where I would stay with them. Excellent. Thank you. So next question we have, are there national advocacy groups working on policy regarding e-waste? If you've got a list, some in mind, feel free to put them in the chat. I feel like this is a good brainstorming moment too. So here in California, um, a local chapter of the uh, Sierra Club is, has received a grant from the California Tobacco Prevention Program. And, uh, you know, we're hopeful that that initial effort will bubble up, if you will, um, within the Sierra Club as a whole. That, you know, this, this issue... It, it gets, unfortunately, a lot of hand-wringing, um, you know, and some press coverage from time to time, but uh, the industry is politically powerful, and a, a lot of people, I think, out there feel that there are other higher priorities, and they don't want to be um, troubled by having to deal with the tobacco industry. Yeah, that certainly adds up. Um, we've got a handful of questions left. Um, the next one I want to get into is, I mean, maybe we can answer this or kind of uh, toss it around a little bit, but why are vapes able to contain known carcinogens? Why aren't they compelled to put this information on labels? 
I think that's a question of a lack of uh, regulation and enforcement. Great, excellent answer. Well, I'm getting, I'm getting note in the chat to wrap it up. Um, I want to thank you both again, um, Dr. Mock and Lucas, for presenting today, for coming on with your expertise, your information. Um, cannot thank you enough. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for attending this panel, this breakout. We really, really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you all again next year. Thanks, Thanks so much. very much. And I'll just say one thing. I thought that that was a great panel. Um, with Dr. Mock, um, Jeremiah, and with and with Lucas, uh, and Charlie's moderating, and um, I think we really need to think about holding FDA accountable uh, on this as well. Because remember, for years, from let's say 2016 to 2020, it didn't appear that they were requiring these companies, the vaping companies, to give consumers guidance about exactly how these products should be disposed of. Um, so again, the regulatory delays and failures and loopholes um, have not been helpful. And again, thanks to our great panel. It was really interesting. And I hope people will listen in after to a really impactful parent panel that was going on in the other room as well. Thanks.